don't think that the Republicans have the backbone to do the kind of cuts that uh, Elon Musk did at Twitter. And that's sort of what we need in government right now. We need to get rid of the administrative bureaucracy. There are 435 agencies, probably just a handful of those we need. So they all need to be cut. And uh, there are 4.3 million uh, permanent civil service employees that uh, those need to be cut. And, and yeah, basically, you need a Congress to do to the administrative state what uh, Elon Musk did to Twitter. Uh, but because they face no economic necessity to do that, it's going to take real bravery. And they just don't, they don't seem to have that, unfortunately. Yeah, well, there's no payoff to politicians for cutting spending. So, you know, I, I just don't know. I mean, they always promise a good game, and I've seen this again and again. But I, I would have to wait and see. Now, of course, none of these budgets that they pass will be signed by Biden. And then that leads to, you know, the great budget standoff and the, the, the budget, uh, then the government shutdowns once it's not passed. And the debt increases are not approved. And then the Republicans, then it becomes a war of words. So I'm afraid we're looking at uh, that to at least two more years of gridlock. I don't know how much worse it has to get in this country before uh, the Republican Party wakes up and starts giving a clear message and before the American people realize that we desperately need change. I think part of the problem is that people are just demoralized right now. You know, I mean, there was a great optimism going into Tuesday. It didn't materialized for the reasons I think I, I mentioned. Uh, but, you know, what that does is it causes people to just kind of give up. And that's exactly, in a sense, what, I guess, for lack of a better term, they want you to do. They want you to give up and be demoralized. Um, but right now, you know, we're in a very strange situation in this country where we've got an elite class of rulers at all levels, public sector, private sector, nonprofits, that are really lording it over the rest of us and you know, driving the economy into the ground. And it's it's killing uh, living standards in America. I mean, we, we're seeing continual declines in real income. And uh, people are digging into their, throwing their credit cards around wildly. I mean, the credit card debt is ballooning, even though credit card uh, interest rates are running 17%. Before it's, before Powell's done, they're going to be 25%. So people are going to be stuck with these very high debts. That's a, that's a looming problem. You can't just forgive that debt, or maybe you can. But I'm so I'm just not seeing a lot of hope out there uh, in the economic realm. Um, I'm pretty sure Powell, now this has been a little bit of a surprise. When he started increasing the federal funds rate, I thought it was just purely cosmetic, that it wasn't really going to happen, that uh, the Fed was pretty dedicated to avoiding recession, um, you know, at all costs, as they have been for the better part of 40 years. But I think that I was wrong about that. I think Powell is serious about this. He's been convinced, and I think probably rightly, that we need to get real. Uh, we need to get interest rates in, in a positive territory in real terms. Which is to say, he's got to get the federal funds rate above the inflation rate. Which, depending on how you measure it, I think the Fed prefers the PCE, PCE ratio, which is a personal consumption and expenditure, which is running about six percent, forty-year high. Right now, interest rates are uh, approaching, what, 4%, something like that. So we've got at least two or three more 75% basis uh, points of, of uh, upward movement, which will get us to the, the spring and summer. But, but it may have to be higher than that. And also, that depends on the idea that the recurrent rate of inflation stabilizes rather than gets worse, which we don't have any assurances of that either. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty sure Powell's dedicated to... Um, uh, to this current mission. Like he believes he's not going to get inflation under control until he can obtain positive interest rates, what he calls the terminal rate. Um, and even if that involves uh, bringing about you know, a really a deep uh, recession, that's they're, they're pretty committed to this. Uh, Powell seems like a very angry man right now. $6.3 trillion that was unleashed over the last 30 months is anywhere endemic in the economy. Uh, we're nowhere near done with it. And I'm sorry, the 7.7 is just nothing to write home about. Uh, the other thing is, that, you know, don't forget that, you know, the month to month increases in July were zero. And that made Biden really happy. And then that trend reversed. So uh, month over month, we're the same place we were last month, no change, which is 04 
percent. So the year over year averages are just being dragged down by a summer slowdown, but I don't think it really represents anything substantial. Why the stock markets are moving? Well, you know, um, you know, it's a, a little bit like if you've ever played the slots at Vegas, what happens is you put in hundred dollars and it goes down to 90, it goes down to 80, it goes down to 70. Then it goes up $10 and you start getting optimistic. So you still feed your money in. <laughs> I'm afraid that's where we are with the stock markets right now. It's been down, 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 up, up, down, 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 up, up. And um, I, I think there's some sense of relief that the elections are over and 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 people with no nowhere else to put their money right now are, are throwing it into to stocks. We'll see how long that lasts. I mean, it could correct downwards and and really not amount to to much. But I mean, investors don't have any real choice at this point. The only I would say, yeah, I think th this is a good time to be in real, real stuff, you know, like re like real estate. Uh, that seems really? to be uh, let's talk about that. Well, and, and not not commercial or residential real estate, but but just it's just straight up land. I mean, that seems like you know the, the one of the best deals going out there right now, and that's where all the uh, the big bucks are are headed. Uh, okay. but the business conditions seem too weak right now, and. You know, I, I, I tell, there's somebody else too. You're seeing seeing within the financials a dramatic shift away from all the high performers during the lockdown pandemic period are now being creamed, and the stuff that's really booming is you know the 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 commodities, the retail sector, and hospitality and traditional you know, kind of re real work sort of stuff. I mean, that's where the action is in the economy right now. That's where the, the job, we're seeing huge shifts in the labor market. Um, and, and the, the you know, the, the, the unemployment rates really disguise this, but you're seeing a real sort of euthanasia of the, of the overclass within these large, large the tech companies that got so bloated over 14 years of 0% interest rates. Uh, that are not able to sustain that under high inflationary conditions with uh, uh, very low liquidity in the market. So they're, you know, you're seeing these huge cuts taking place at you know, Twitter and Facebook and Amazon and Google, and it's just begun. You know, it's really going to be something. So we've got a lot, of, and all these people are hitting the job market at the same time. So where are the job uh, opportunities out there? Well, they're in, you know, real work that requires nine to five, like working with your hands sort of stuff and hospitality. And, and otherwise, so a lot of these workers are going to be very disappointed to discover that their their PJ weed soaked life of the last uh, twenty four months is is not sustainable. the The U three numbers are really pretty much useless, uh, and okay. we discovered this because they only measure people who are on the job market. And in times of labor shortages, those are going to be very very low. But if you want to look at what's really going on, you know, check out labor participation rates and worker population ratios. That's where you see that we're nowhere near pre-pandemic levels. And if you run a regression from the rate of increase that was that was in place in 2019, we're probably missing 8.3 million people from the workforce through women that dropped out to take care of their kids because the daycares were closed and the schools were closed and they just having to come back. Early retirements have taken place. Uh, a lot of people have just moved home and and forgotten about jobs. It's it's That's it's a it's, it's a work ethic problem. But 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 just people are just not returned to work yet after the disaster of 2020 and make a contribution. Are you going to be doing just fine? Right. I mean, those those people are doing just fine. So, uh, which I hope that includes your listeners. So they're going to be okay. Uh, but the the problems are going to ex exist in in the among those class of people that thought they could earn six figures by by just tricking their mouse by their, their boss by buying mouse jigglers from Amazon and <laughs> light, lighting up the slack lighting up the slack button that says I'm busy. That's not going to work anymore. <laughs> yes. Eighteen months that they have forestalled doing anything about. You know they've invested a lot of capital. Uh, for a long time, because they didn't want to pass on the the cost to consumers, they don't know where that you know that magic point is where uh, their high prices actually reduce uh, demand to the point that they you know just start hitting revenue. Um, but we're really probably reaching the end of that point. And then when that arrives, you've got real problems. Actually, you're already starting to see this. So you're starting to cut, start to see dramatic. Cost reduction, uh, starting with the labor force. But if that doesn't work, you know, what happens next? Especially when 
uh, you're starting to see real, uh, you're starting to see, you know, dramatic, not real wages increases, but, but real, what's called, you know, wa uh, uh, wage uh, uh, push, wage push inflation you know, is taking place. So you get more, you know, r rising wages at a lower real wage, but rising in, in uh, nominal terms. And then that goes out and, you know, it, it, it turns into hot money on the street, which only feeds more inflationary expectations. And then you've got the cost pool uh, factory happening with businesses. So you've got an end of uh, really embeddedness to this inflation right now. So I'm not too optimistic that we're going to continue to see this this softening trend. The other thing we need to remember is that, you know, the Fed's target rate of inflation is 2%, but that, that we're never going back to 2019 prices. And this is this is the uh, the tragedy of the whole thing. I mean, for a long time, people thought, oh, but well, this is just a temporary glitch. You know, we're going to go back to normal in no time. Well, that's, that's just not going to happen. I mean, we are right now where we we're going to be for, for forever i was running some numbers this morning i'm just kind of taking a broad look at this since 1980 if you wanted to have a, a dollar in 1980 you did nothing but hold on to it it's now worth 25 cents so you know over the 40-year period we've seen a you know a devastating uh, devaluation take place in dollars and a lot of that has happened over the last uh, uh two years so okay. uh, there's not going to be any going back. Uh, like I, and plus, I really don't see this inflation going uh, going away or getting anywhere near that two percent target uh, anytime in the next twelve months. Yeah, uh, and then right beneath it is like, oh, there's uh, the dollar's weak. Well, which is it, right? <laughs> you know, it's unfortunate that that people get very. Confused I guess it depends it. if you travel a lot or not. But yes, go, go on. Well, but even then, you know, what's interesting is it, it means that the dollar is strong relative to other currencies. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that uh, the, you know. Let's just take the, something like the, the euro or some other obscure, you know, the pound or whatever. Uh, still. Uh, traveling to London today as versus five years ago is going to be vastly more expensive because the dollar is weaker in terms of all goods and services all over the world. It's just that the exchange rate between the dollar and these other currencies makes the dollar look relatively strong. So you're going to have a, 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 a more powerful spending experience in London today than you did today than you would have three years ago if you're using dollars uh, rather rather than using pounds. So that's the way it works. I mean, that's how you can have a strong dollar that's actually being devalued all the time. So I, th I think that this is just too many steps of thinking for most people. That's why they get confused about it. The value of, of the purchasing power yeah. of the dollar. Now, in terms of its status as an international reserve currency, wow, that has been shored up over the last uh, uh, two years, really, and in ways that I didn't expect, you know. More than 60% of global trade is still conducted with the still, USD, Jeff. And, and it's, I haven't looked at that recently, but it's most likely uh, probably rising. And that's just simply because as bad as our central bank is, it's been able to get away with a lot more uh, quantitative easing than any other uh, central bank in the world, precisely because the U.S. has the advantage of being the world reserve currency. And I, I assume that we've got a lot more years built into that. That's going to continue to be uh, true, if, even if the dollar continues to lose purchasing power in terms of goods and services domestically and really all over the world. So you just don't notice it as much because our competition is you know, sucks even more than we do, basically. <laughs> than they are right now. And I'm not just talking about Federal Reserve statistics, but industry statistics. I mean, basically, you call it a buyer's market if there were any buyers. You know, it's it's really been an incredible disaster. I mean, and, and think how quickly this happened. It was only about 14 months ago. When you whispered to your neighbor, you were thinking about selling your house, you had 10 people lined up at your front door ready to buy, outbidding each other, right? And that was 14 months ago. And now, you know, those same people just, finally got around to patching the holes in the wall and vacuuming the carpets and putting it on the market. And now there's no takers, right? So the whole market has been frozen by the Fed's uh, uh, federal funds policy, which has just driven up uh, mortgage rates to 7%. I expect them to go to 
to, to, to 10 and higher, you know, and so there's, there's absolutely no hope right now in uh, residential real estate.